Yeah. So I will start. Okay. Yeah. So, so we are live on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, so this is the fourth week of uh, masterclass. I am very glad that uh, we have around close to 300 people with us now for this uh, series of masterclass, which I have announced in the morning. So today's topic is AMH. AMH, as we all know, is one of the uh, ovarian uh, reserve tests and uh, Dr. Jay will be speaking about it. So I came across this uh, innovative terminology called uh, preventive infertility management, wherein if there is one test which can predict or forecast the reproductive life of a woman, and if it gives us a hint that the woman is not going to conceive naturally or her fertility window is quite small. So is there any way that we can apply the fertility preserving uh, techniques that we have now, either like oocyte freezing or embryo freezing and make it better for her to have her own biological child? So is AMH one of those uh, ORTs? So we will come to know at the end of this session. So I hand over it to Dr. Jay to give this session. Okay. Shilpa Madam, just stay unmuted. I'll start the screen sharing, okay? Okay, I think you can see my screen, right? Everyone? Yes. Fine. So uh, today, actually, we are going to talk something about AMH. Okay. And uh, it is important that whenever we are trying to talk about AMH, we should actually understand how this entire thing of AMH works, you know. So if I just write AMH here, this is what we are going to be studying. This practically means anti mullerian hormone. Okay. So I'm just going to draw a nice diagram which is going to help you understand, you know, how it works. See, inside the ovary, you know, there are millions of such small, 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 small follicles. Okay. These are called as primary follicles. Okay. From primary follicles, there is one stage above that where you know, they form some amount of granulosa cells besides them. Very small quantity gra granulosa cells. Okay. This stage where very small prime is formed is called as primordial follicles. Okay. Following this, there is one more stage above this. Okay. This is called as preantral follicle. Now, this preantral follicle actually has some granulosa cells around it. Huh? All of these have granulosa cells around it. Obviously, inside it is the oocyte. So, all of these preantral follicles, these are the people who are going to get recruited. Okay. Above this, you have. small antral follicles which we normally see and above this you have the large antral follicles. Okay. So now your anti mullerian hormone is going to be predominantly secreted by this category. Small antral follicles and preantral follicles. These are the people who secrete anti mullerian hormone. The most important function of anti mullerian hormone is to inhibit further growth of primordial follicles. Okay, this is inhibitive. Why? It's very simple. It doesn't want your ovarian reserve to deplete. As a result of which, when your AMH value is high, that means the number of preantral follicles you have in the system is high, okay? Which means it is trying to protect your reserve for primordial follicles and primary follicles, which is why you say that, okay, when you have a normal AMH, which is between 
2 to 8.5. This is considered to be our normal AMH values based on age dependent parameters. Okay. You can say that somebody has a normal ovarian reserve. What typically happens is commonly when the AMH value is down, for example, when the AMH value is let's say less than one, that means the total number of preantral follicles are very, very less due to which the AMH value is low. This low value is causing less inhibition on the primordial follicles. Okay. And it is stimulating more of them to grow up that why please come inside the system. We need more of you for reproduction. Simultaneously, this low value of AMH also allows FSH values to go up so that these small follicles, just in case one of these guys missed out, this high natural induced FSH value, okay, can inhibit the threshold of recruitment and can recruit as many follicles as we can. Okay, as a result of which in patients with low AMH, you have an increased FSH value as well. Okay, please keep this in mind. Predominantly, the AMH is going to get secreted from this granulosa cells. These granulosa cells, no? It is these guys who are going to secrete all the AMH inside the blood circulation. Okay, I must tell you one very important thing. As the follicle grows larger and larger and larger in size, E2 values of the follicles keeps on growing up. Because the E2 value in the follicle grows up, E2 directly inhibits the AMH inside that particular follicle and it ensures that there is no further expression of AMH from the large enteral follicle onwards because E2 is inhibitory over the AMH values. Just keep this in mind. You are going to understand why I just mentioned about E2 here because we have one particular condition which is polycystic ovarian syndrome and in polycystic ovarian syndrome when AMH values are considered to be more than 10, we feel that okay, if the AMH is more than 10, that means there are more number of follicles which are recruited but it can also mean that there are more number of apoptotic follicles. Okay. The predominant reason why in a why in PCOS the AMH value rises is because there is an abnormal granulosa cell response. Okay. It is believed that this abnormal granulosa cell response occurs due to increased values of LH, which is common in PCOS patients. And because there is increased value of LH, granulosa cell response is very, very poor and it causes E2 to stay low because it causes androgen values to go high. And because the androgen value goes high in PCOS, there is reduced T2. Because there is reduced T2, there is reduced negative feedback onto AMH due to which in PCOS patients, AMH value is normally very high. Okay. This is actually the basic. All right. Now, clinical application of all this gender. Okay. So, we know one thing for sure. AMH and antral follicle count. We always try to look at two things. Whenever we want to study anything, we always want to look at these two things. Correct? I'll just clear off everything. Your AMH and antral follicle count. There are going to be certain instances, especially in cases of low AMH, where there is going to be no correlation of antral follicle count with the value of AMH which is concerned. In that type of situation, should you consider AMH or should you consider antral follicle count? Please remember, for that particular cycle, it is important that you look at antral follicle count as far as stimulation is concerned. Okay. The same theory of androgen which I explained in my previous slide is also going to help you understand what is the role of using testosterone gel in patients with low AMH, especially when you want to use it for 21 days. It has been proven 21 days in the previous cycle. What it does is this 21 days causes estrogen values in those follicles to go down, which allows for a good amount of reverse negative feedback onto AMH and thereby 
it increases the fsh in that particular cycle and it allows more follicles to be recruited okay that is the reason why after testosterone gel one may find a slightly increased antral follicle count in your next cycle okay now because one more clinical point because amh is predominantly secreted by the small antral follicles just remember guys these small antral follicles are absolutely not dependent on exogenous fsh lh at all okay they do not have that dependency on these guys as a result of which amh can be tested on any day of the cycle and at any time of the day okay it usually has got no correlation to all these things simultaneously you don't even need the patient to be fasting amh is commonly available in india as a standard elisa kit okay this is a standard kit which is going to be available in almost all the machines which you are using vidas mindray whichever whichever machine you are using it is going to be the same beckman coulter everybody is the same and it uses the same kit there are just two kits which are predominantly available in india based on which your amh values are going to be reported it's a wonderful standardized test we do it in house i'm sure people who are interested should buy these machines as long as you have a particular workload you will be able to gather fantastic momentum from this amh and it will really help you as far as your clinical practice is concerned okay so with that i finished the basic presentation on anti mullerian hormone i thought this session we will try and answer more questions and doubts uh, of people as far as amh is concerned okay uh, uh, shall i start yes please start so what is this uh, alexis machine like uh, do you know about it is it just a form of another elisa or is it something uh, it's a point of it's a point of uh, that point of uh, there is a point of care machine right you know it gives you spot values something like that on basis of a card okay and uh, what is your running time for this test in your machines 1 hour 1 hour 15 minutes maximum okay i think the it ranges the cost for this between uh, anywhere between 2000 to 2500 so what no, is the cost the cost of the kit is 800 rupees is it yeah so here for them the running cost with this roche uh, alexis machine the coba is 8000 it is about yeah. 500 rupees and uh, they charge around 2200 in bangalore correct okay. so uh, what is about the uh, the uh, variations that we get with the amh even is it like you do a lot of qcs and uh, uh, do you uh, with every with every kit there is a qc code which is available you need to configure that qc code so one kit has approximately uh, enough uh, to run around 60 samples okay so if your volume is good no then you will end up finishing doing 60 samples in let's say 5 days or a week or so then you don't have to run repeated qa qcs okay and what about external quality assurance i mean do you do that like you compare uh, uh, with the other labs so uh, honestly we just do it once in a month okay oh. with any of the other labs but not very routinely not beyond once in a month okay so coming to clinical application of this amh so uh, i think amh we all do it to know whether they are hyper poor responders or hyper responders so in your practice i mean which is more sensitive like uh, is it for more of hyper responders or poor responders or it is like hyper responders always every value of any hormone is good only when it is in the lower side so even amh is same same thing it is very much more sensitive for low responders for higher responders no value more than 9 your kit will process it that way value more than 9 so then when you dilute it no when you dilute this then you get further values let's say 16 22.3 28.5 all these values more than a particular threshold is going to indicate that the value is beyond the normal mean deviation okay in that situation no matter how high the value is okay it is a poor response only because it is predominantly going to indicate polycystic ovarian syndrome so uh, there is one set of population like pcos in adolescents where amh uh, doesn't really correlate well with uh, the pcod uh, thing i mean uh, what do you have to say on that 
It's a fact. The reason why PCOS in adolescents, uh, AMH alone, I would not use, I would not say AMH doesn't correlate. I would say AMH alone doesn't correlate because uh, the hypothalamo pituitary ovarian and the hypothalamo adrenal axis is not so well developed in these girls. Okay, it takes approximately age of eighteen for these uh, the axis to be completely mature. You know, and beyond age eighteen, you can use AMH as a marker. Okay, so you told that uh, the AMH will be low, but uh, uh, the AFC may be good in that cycle. So that you take the relevance of that AFC to that particular cycle. But what is the role of AMH for that patient? And you counsel them. Uh, what do you do in such cases? The lower the AMH, no matter what you do, it is going to fall by approximately one logarithmic value. So around 8 to 10 percent every year, no matter what you do, right? No matter what drugs you give, it will not even increase, be, increase beyond the logarithmic value. It is not going to happen that AMH from 1.5 has become 5.5. That can never happen. You know, so I think one of the most important counselings which people, which we must do to people, especially in today's modern fertility practice, especially with this huge amount of, uh, you know, uh, fertility clinics which are available, is to ensure the patient that they don't waste time just thinking, you know, when they have low AMH. See, a lot of these times, it's very difficult for people to absorb information. That is because they are either illiterate or they are literate but fools, you know, they are half read. So these half-read people take a lot of time and we must give them counseling that yeah, your value is on the lower side. You act upon it fastly. Okay. And do you do AMH uh, before any kind of uh, gonadotoxic uh, treatments for cancers or uh, do you document? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mandatory. See, AMH is to be mandatorily done before any ovarian cystectomy. AMH is to be mandatorily done before any oncofertility program. Mandatory. Mandatory. There is no question in that. Uh, so, is there any added benefit of uh, using FSH by AMH ratio? I don't use it, madam. And what is the peak level of AMH that you have come across in your practice, the highest value? Highest value, which I have seen, yeah. is 31. Wow. So, what happened in that case? Very poor response to stimulation. If they mostly, any value more than 20, you know, they will end up with empty follicle syndrome. You know, it is better that when the value is so high up, no, madam, to do PCOS drilling in these patients, wait for one to two months and then take them up for stimulation. Okay. So, uh, the AMH decline, uh, it is ethnic. Uh, uh, I think it has got... No. no, I think no. No, no, no. I think it has been now proven that there is no ethnic ethnic variation, no food variation, no racial variation, nothing like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, do you... Uh, how... Uh, accurately, can you predict menopause uh, with the AMH values? Uh, FSH has to be more than 20 for more than two occasions, two to three months apart. Okay, for uh, egg freezing, what is the AMH that you look at and uh, suggest egg freezing? Forget about social egg freezing where they are not sure, but when is it that uh, at what AMH value that you suggest egg freezing? AMH less than 1, AFC less than 5. That is our standard counselling. And in that, how many oocytes would you expect uh, to freeze? Three. Three metaphase 2 oocytes. Oh, that's all? I mean, for their... Yeah. Uh, okay. Because they will also end up, madam, having a lot of metaphase 1 oocytes. Okay. So, uh, between FSH uh, plus inhibitor plus E2 versus AMH, so, what has your experience been, uh, which is more uh, uh, accurate or which is more, uh, uh, say, replicable and uh, constant? AMH. AMH, because it is the easiest, the kit is the easiest, which is available, madam. And uh, post GNRH administration, when FSH and LH increase, so yeah. is there any change in the AMH? I have never tested it like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in your thing, you mentioned AFC and AMH, but above all this, uh, age is still, I think, uh, the most important factor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Age is the most important factor. I actually also wanted to tell one more thing. A uh, lot of people want to experiment with uh, this nonsense called ovarian PRP. 
when patient is having low AMH. Okay. Fortunately, we have 400 people listening to us. So kindly note it down that ovarian PRP is one of the most shittiest therapy on earth. Okay. In fact, shittiest is a good word because Shilpa Madam does not like me using bad words. There is no role of doing ovarian PRP on increasing AMH. Okay. If you don't want to listen to me, kindly pick up your phone, dial some of your stupid friends practicing in Europe. They will also tell you because in SRA also that has come. Okay. I do a lot of stem cell therapy, but I want to tell you very honestly in ovarian stem cell therapy. Okay. It does not help in more than 15 to 20% of the cases. It does not increase the AMH. Okay. It may just help in increasing the quality of the residual follicles which you recruit at this point in time. Okay. It will only improve the quality of the residual follicles which you recruit. It will not increase the AMH values. So kindly don't uh, prepare a wrong PRP, do a transvaginal thing and keep on injecting inside the ovary. In fact, transvaginal is not even a recommendation because you need a spinal needle to inject perpendicular to inject tangential to the cortex. That is where you want your PRP to go. You can never achieve that in a transvaginal scan, even if you have invented transvaginal scan. Okay. So please, I think that should be a very important take home point because we are discussing clinical aspects of AMH. Yeah. Sorry, Shilpa madam, you can continue. Yeah. So uh, see these ORTs, that is the ovarian reserve testing, be it FSH, be it AMH, be it AFC. Yeah. These are, we are uh, checking the quantitative uh, ovarian reserve. Okay. Yeah. Uh, whether we can really like, you know, uh, intervene and improve the quality or say like uh, increase the dosage of your gonadotrophins or probably like uh, how you said stem cells and all those things. I mean, uh, do you feel that it is uh, anything which is cost effective can be done in such, uh, such situations? Not at this point in time, madam. Not at this point in time. The reason is, see, whenever the AMH value is low, no, it also indicates that the oocyte which is har harboring, you see, it is the oocyte which is going to allow formation of granulosa cells. Then the granulosa cells will secrete AMH, right? So when the AMH value is low, it indicates in itself a slightly inherent problem in the oocyte. Okay. Yes. The oocyte itself is not very strong enough. Okay. Had the oocyte been strong enough, multiple strong oocytes would have come. Okay. And they would have recruited good follicles, which would have had a good AMH. Okay. The very fact that this is happening, it itself indicates that oocyte quality could be an issue. So till we can't, I mean, you know, in research settings, people are doing mitochondrial transfer. Till we don't do that routinely. Okay. I don't think there is any other mechanism by which we can enhance this permanently. You can do it temporarily for a single cycle or so by giving testosterone gel, but I don't think we can do it permanently. Okay. Uh, so, as you said, AMH is more uh, for a poor response. So, uh, at what AMH do you discourage any form of uh, self cycle? See, it is better to look at it in this way. If AMH is less than 0 0.1, antral follicle count is 1, and FSH is more than 16. Okay. In these type of situations, your response to stimulation will be very poor. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, also do one thing. On day 2, you should do estradiol. If estradiol on day two is less than 10, it itself indicates that there is no inherent estrogen which is being secreted by the follicle. If there is no inherent estrogen by the follicle, even if you see the follicle on, uh, on your antral follicle count, it will most probably come out to be an atretic or an empty follicle. So maybe you can counsel the patient accordingly. Hmm. So when you are already started stimulation, so if you do AMH during the process of stimulation, I mean, there are various literature which says that you get a wrong report. Yeah, you do. That is because of high value of estrogen on stimulation. You may have a falsely low value of AMH, but it is not going to be that value of AMH 8 is going to become 1. It is that that value of 8 AMH might become 6.5, something like that. Uh, so these ORTs, whatever we have, it is mainly to counsel the uh, patient about the response or what she can expect as the labor rate for uh, uh, her thing. So uh, whether you can really predict the response just based on these ORTs, that is uh, AMH and AFC, 
or you could try something uh, where you can still just go ahead and do the first cycle of IVF, keep it as an index cycle and improvise it or in the successive cycles. I mean, uh, what is the scenario? Because in Western, where there are uh, three IVFs free of cost to the patients, so they just go ahead and do one cycle of IVF and then they keep it as their index and they go on changing or uh, manipulating depending on uh, the patient's profile. So I'll answer this question. It depends on which country you are practicing in. Okay. For example, if you're practicing in China, China has three IVF cycles uh, complementary to every Chinese citizen. If they want to have like, if they have two children and they want to have the third one, okay, they can do three IVF cycles, right? But it doesn't allow you to do the donor program. But simultaneously, they have a huge AI data of, uh, you know, how to stimulate a particular lady at a particular age at a particular AFC. So they can probably modulate in their country according to that without using index cycles. Countries which do not have that, especially like let's say Belgium, Spain, in all these places, Germany, you can do two IVF cycles which are sponsored by the state, following which your rest of the IVF cycles, you have to do it on your own cost. It may or may not be covered by insurance. Okay. So... These type of regional variations are going to happen everywhere, Shilpa, madam. I personally think India is a very price sensitive market. Here in India, as far as, as far as IVF is concerned, everybody is doing free IVF OPD. Everybody wants to do IVF cycles in 10,000 rupees, you know, with an asterisk. So what normally happens is in a country like India, this type of scenario cannot be practiced is what I think for practical purposes. So I think, uh, yeah. Mm. So metformin uh, usage can it uh, change the AMH value? No, it only it only sensitizes the ovary to insulin, and it may help in reducing LH. It does not increase the response. In hypo hypo, does the AMH correlate uh, well? Yes, because in hypo hypo, as I said, this is going to be predominantly secreted by those small follicles which are about to be rescued by FSH, correct? So the body will keep on producing that AMH, understanding. I mean, the body will keep on recruiting those follicles in hypo because there is no FSH endogenously. No recruitment will happen and these follicles will become apoptotic. So according to AMH, say like if you have uh, 0.1 AMH, is it like we are going to get one oocyte, 0.2 AMH, we are going to get two oocytes? Not easy to predict this at AMH less than one. But any AMH more than one, like let's say AMH one, you know that you will get three metaphase two sites. AMH two, that means you will get anywhere between six to eight, something like that. AMH three means you will get somewhere between, you know, 10 to 12. Of course, you can get more also based on whatever the way in which you hyperstimulate. But at AMH less than one, it is very difficult to predict. Because even if you get two sites, they may or may not be mature sites. That is the problem. And uh, do you use nomograms of AMH and uh, adjust the dose of your gonadotropin depending? No. no? Okay. Yeah. So uh, from my side, that those were the questions. So I'll just check the chat box. So AMH test pre and post surgery for endometriosis, when to do? Pre-surgery and post-surgery. Uh -oh. Pre-surgery means two days before the surgery. And post-surgery, if you do for the first six weeks, your value will crash down. But after three to four months, if your surgery is good, then the values would normally stabilize, but they will they will go down by, let's say, 10 to 15%. Pitot drilling, does it reduce high AMH like it reduces LH? Difficult to predict. It may not reduce high AMH, but it will increase the response to stimulation. Unmarried. In high AMH. Oh, sorry. Unmarried lady, 31 years with AMH 0.6 with short cycles, planning to get married after one year, anxious for future conception. So at this moment, I mean, what would be your advice? Side freezing. Side freezing. Um, yeah. So if the AMH value is above 11, what is the dose of HMG in IVF cycles you use? No, no. My dose is standardized. I have told this many, many times, right? My dose in IVF is standardized, 300 international units. You kindly do not do individualized COS when you are doing more than 100 IVF cycles, please. 
So when do you advise for uh, donor oocyte program below what level of AMH? When one or two cell cycles would fail at AMH, let's say, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, patient doesn't want to do uh, cell cycles anymore, then we'll normally refer to either Sachin Dalal or Mohit Sarogi or somebody. Okay. And what about uh, pooling of oocytes in uh, low AMH or low AFC? Uh, you can do double stimulation rather than pooling. So any significance of AMH value in pituitary surgery? Oh, that's an interesting thing. Nothing will happen to AMH in that. Hmm. Nothing will happen because hypo-hypo will be established. Same thing in AMH for Sheehan syndrome. Same thing in AMH for that, uh, you know, uh, pan hypo all these, All these people. The only problem with all these things is because a lot of other hormones are inhibited for a pituitary problem. Oocyte quality is poor. Try and understand. Even if you give HFG and you, you know, manage FSH and LH, there are so many other small things which are responsible. Relax in, cortisol, this, that. So somewhere or the other, it affects the oocyte. There is no doubt in that, you know. Okay. 24-year-old AMH 0 0.01 and day 2 cyst in both ovaries, 2 centimeter cyst. So what would you suggest? Repeat the AMH first. Okay. So apart from PCO, any other condition where AMH is increased? Not that. Not that I can think of, honestly. Sometimes it's idiopathic hirsutism, but not very significant. Yeah, I think. Uh, so previous cycle OCP, does it affect the AMH value? No. Can you lose a cell tumor? That can have little increase in AMH, huh? granulosa cell tumors. But not again, It's you are not using it as a marker. Try and understand. In granulosa cell tumors, your marker is inhibit. Your marker is not uh, AMH. So that AMH which you asked to repeat, they have repeated it after two months and it's the same. Aspirate the cyst and do oocyte freezing, please. Okay. Yeah. So I think we have uh, come to an end. So it was excellent. I think uh, it was one of those sessions where uh, not much of literature can be found, especially with regard to the clinical aspects. But uh, I think in the present day situation uh, of uh, fertility of Indian women or even women across the globe, I think these uh, points help a lot in counseling our patients in our clinical practice. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks everyone for... Uh, joining us at this time. We'll see you again.